attend anywhere video consultation clinical training. My name is Sandra Lees. I work in the implementation and business change team at NHS Digital um, and we're currently working with NHS England to help them in this very rapid rollout of Attend Anywhere. I've got uh, two colleagues who are also joining the call this afternoon. We've got Kay Sandu, who uh, works for NHS Digital, and Zephan Trent, who works for NHS England, and they're going to do a bit of a demonstration of the system for you. Now, I need to just go through some housekeeping with you, first of all, just to make sure everybody's found the mute button and everybody's muted. Um, it does give us some feedback, actually, if you unmute. Um, so it's just to make it smoother for everybody. Um, we have got a lot of internet traffic, as you can imagine at the moment, so it could be that we experience some problems. We've been fairly lucky today, so just bear with us if we do. Uh, this session's for an hour, so it will uh, finish at 4.30. It's mainly demoing. There will be a little bit of interaction, um, but you can put your questions through the chat function, and we'll either answer those as we go or we will answer them at the end, and we'll also compile them into our FAQs document, which will be on the NHS Futures website. Um, I will talk to you about forthcoming training events, and I will show you the NHS Futures website in case any of you don't have access at the moment. There may be, um, you might want to note this email address down, so it's england.vceoe at nhs.net. Um, that will take you through to the VC project team and they will be able to answer any questions you've got about this um, particular project. I think the training session is being recorded, so you should be able to see that at the top of your screen. Um, and if you can provide us with training feedback, that would be very helpful because we're only a few days ahead of you on this and any feedback you can give us at the moment will be very gratefully received. So here's the agenda for this today's session. Um, I've got a little bit more information to give you. And so I'll do that before I hand over to Zephan Trent, who's going to do a demo of the product platform. Um, and he'll also do an interactive uh, practice session. So we'll get you to dial in as a patient and we'll be able to demonstrate the clinician view during a consultation. And then, as I say at the end, we'll have the opportunity to answer your questions. Uh, now, this is just to talk about the regional training that we've had on offer and that is ongoing on offer. So we've had a two hour project launch webinar. Uh, that is actually currently on the NHS Futures website. Then we've had two one hour um, platform demonstrations that was on Thursday and Friday last week. Those um, video links are going to be added to the Futures website. Then we've got the platform management training, which is happening at 9.30 and 1.30 every day this week. That's for an hour and a half. And then that's followed by the clinical training at 11.30 and 3.30 every day. So there are more sessions tomorrow and we will be releasing more information about the training next week. Uh, for anybody that's interested, there's a three hour platform management training webinar, which is on the uh, Futures website or about to be added to the Futures website. Um, and just to tell you that there's no need to book onto training sessions. You can just jump onto any one that you want. If you want to do more than one, that's also fine. Um, where, you know, the more the merrier. So this slide is really just to show you what people in the various teams will need to know. And the same as this slide, it's really the five day implementation plan. This is split down by work streams. So you can see all your clinical processes here on the second row. Um, and you'll be able to discuss this with your implementation project person, um, who I'll talk to you about in a second. Um, so they will go through all these particular features with you. 
This is our resources slide, so just to tell you what resources we've got available and that they're available on the Futures web space. And then at the bottom there, we've got the training videos, um, lots of YouTube videos. They're very short, very informative, um, and you should find them very useful. If you get the opportunity to go and have a look, um, do use these links because these, this slide set will be, again, on the Futures website. So you'll just be able to go and click directly on the links. So to come back to your virtual implementation partner, once you've returned your documentation, you'll be assigned a dedicated implementation partner for your particular trust. And that partner will be your key point of contact during the implementation period. They'll be as responsive as they can be between the hours of nine and five on a Monday to Friday. But if you have told us you're going to be implementing this over the weekend, then we will come back to you about your contact because it's likely to be different from the key partner. And the only other thing that we um, request really is that you've accessed the supporting documentation before calling. OK, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, Zephan Trent. I'm a director of strategic transformation and a locality director in the east of England region. Uh, hi, Sandra, can you hear me? Hi. Hello, can you hear me there? Yeah, Seven, we can hear you now, yes. Yeah, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, uh, so uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Zef. Uh, I'm uh, a director of strategic transformation and locality director in the So somebody keeps um, switching the mute on for everybody. Uh, if you, if I could ask you not to do that, um, that'd be great. Um, so, uh, as I said, my name's uh, Zephan Trent. I'm a director of strategic transformation and locality director in the East of England regional team. Um, prior to this, I was the deputy director of transformation at Imperial College Healthcare uh, in London, uh, and we um, uh, we implemented this platform there. Um, and I jointly led that implementation as part of a national pilot uh, about a year or so ago. Um, so I have some familiarity with it and I hope to be able to demonstrate the platform to you in a moment um, and answer some questions as we go through. Um, uh, I, I've had a comment on the chat box that the sound keeps fading out. Is that still the case? Can somebody just um, let me know? No, uh, that's better, Stefan. I think that was pre previously, but it's OK. OK, now. fantastic. Um, great, OK. Good that it's OK now. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you um, uh, and uh, then I'm going to talk you through what the platform looks like when you go in as a clinician, uh, what it looks like. Um, uh, maybe it's my headset. Um, I can try switching switching off. Uh, can, can people hear me again? Yeah. I can hear you yes. fine. Yeah, OK. I'll try not to move then. Maybe that's what it is. Um, OK, so I'm going to share my screen with you and hopefully um, uh, demonstrate what it looks like as a clinician um, and then again uh, as a patient after that. Um, by the way, if, if you want to switch your video off, there's a button on the screen next to the mute button that will switch your camera on or off if, uh, if you wanted to do that. I know a couple of people were trying to do that earlier. OK, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, you should be able to see a Google home page. Yeah, um, Sandra, okay, could you confirm that to me that that's up on screen? Yes, we can see that. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, this I'm using the Google Chrome browser, that's important. Um, you need to be using either Google Chrome or Safari in order to use this platform. Um, if you're using it on a, a smartphone or a tablet, um, then that's probably fine because most of those uh, have a, either um, Google, Chrome or, or Safari. If you're on a PC, um, you do need to make sure that Chrome's installed and we've been working with the implementation teams in your trust to make sure um, that that's the case. So the first thing you do is, um, uh, if you're going in as a clinician, is you go to the um, Attend Anywhere login. Um, so I've got that here. And what I'm going to show you now is um, this is a test account set up. 
Um, what you'll notice is at the top it says NHS Scotland. Um, that's because we're currently using the NHS Scotland platform. Um, an NHS England platform is going to be set up uh, uh, very soon over the next few days um, and then uh, Trust in England will see uh, NHS England here instead. Um, the uh, email address will be the email address that your uh, Trust um, uh, implementation team have set you up with. So it's probably your um, NHS.net email address or maybe a Trust email address uh, if, if your Trust has a different email. Um, the password is something you set up yourself. Um, you'll be sent an email once a user account is set up for you um, and then it will give you some instructions on how to set that up. Uh, if you forget your password for any reason, there's a forget password button at the bottom here um, uh, and it's just sign in to sign in here. So um, this is a kind of typical view for a clinician. Um, what I can see here is three different waiting areas are set up. Um, the waiting areas we've got are ENT, uh, gynae and ortho. Uh, these are all test areas. Um, this is entirely demonstration um, uh, site that I'm going to show you here. So there's no no real patients in here at any point. Um, so the the waiting areas you see will depend on how your account has been set up, um, uh, and it will depend on on what specialties you cover. Um, so um, you might not cover these three, for example, but you might have one or two different specialties where uh, you've access to the waiting areas. Um, unless you're a trust administrator, you shouldn't have access to all waiting areas and you should just have the ones that you need. So I'm going to show you a little bit around the platform. Uh, there's a home button up here on the top left corner. Um, if I click on that, um, uh, it takes me back to a summary view. Um, so you can see here, this says that there are zero waiting areas with callers um, and nobody's waiting, uh, nobody's idle and nobody's being seen at the moment. Uh, that's of course because it's a test area. Um, there are some buttons at the bottom here. You can look at the users for the waiting area. Um, there's a reports button uh, that allows you to generate some usage reports and see how many patients have been seen, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's a resource center. Um, this is really helpful if you get stuck at any point. Um, there are a number of resources on here. Um, there's a help button at the top. If I click that, you can uh, find out some help about the page. There are some posters. These are really handy kind of um, uh, step by step guides on various commonly um, uh, repeated actions in the platform. There's a technical guide. I'd stay away from that unless you are a technical person. It's got lots of detail about how to configure things, but for the most part, you won't need that. Um, you can test your equipment with this uh, option. It's a support button and then the resource centers a link here. Um, there's my initials and I can look at my profile, my roles and change my password as well. So that's the summary view. Uh, I'll go back into the waiting area now. Um, you can see this uh, this um, band across the top is similar um, and we've got the same help button and uh, uh, personal options here as well. So I'm going to click into the ENT uh, test clinic now um, and I'll show you around this. So at the top you'll see here, and um, this is the name of the waiting area, um, East of England ENT Review VC. Um, that's a bit of a clunky name, to be honest. Um, you can make that much more patient friendly. Um, and I'll show you why that's a good idea when we uh, look at some examples of trust that are already live. Um, underneath it says East of England region. So that should be your trust when you're using this. Um, and then this space here is where the patients will arrive um, uh, once the um, uh, once they've clicked into the waiting area. Um, so we'll, we'll see that a bit later in the demo. Um, this cog is where a lot of your different settings are to customize the waiting areas. As a clinical user, you don't really need to bother with that um, uh, for most things. It'd be rare that you need to use that. Um, this button here, this red um, uh, mobile phone symbol, this is really handy. Um, if I click on this, it allows me to enter a mobile phone number um, and save that and then have a, a new caller alert whenever um, a patient comes into the waiting area. Um, I'm not going to set that up now, but um, common uses of this are where you're using the waiting area as a drop-in service. Um, so I, I know we've got a number of colleagues from uh, Norfolk and Suffolk FT on, on this training session. Um, our colleagues in Dorset Healthcare in the Southwest, um, uh, they're a mental health and community trust. Um, they've used this to provide um, a sort of crisis cafe uh, services online. Um, so uh, when one of their service users is in crisis, they can go into um, a crisis cafe waiting area uh, and because you've got this set up uh, with a text message alert, then the service manager um, or the clinician on duty uh, gets a text message and knows that there's somebody in there to uh, to, to um, uh, contact um, and do a video call with. Um, on the right hand side, 
So up at the top here, I've got um, a picture of a couple of temples. Um, uh, that would actually be your trust uh, logo um, when it's when it's set up for your organization. Um, that, that's reassuring because you know you're in the right place. Um, and this appears a few places uh, when you're using the platform uh, to reassure uh, clinical users and um, uh, other staff and, and uh, patients. You've got some options here about having your microphone and camera switched on or off at the beginning of uh, your video calls. Um, this bit here, waiting areas, this is quite important. Um, so this this uh, room is uh, waiting area is set up as nine till five, Monday to Friday. Um, you can change that. Um, the consequence of these times is that if a patient tries to access this waiting area outside of the set times, um, they'll be told the waiting area is closed. Um, and the same is true for clinical users. If you try and go into a waiting area um, outside of those hours, you'll be told it's closed. Um, and that's quite an important piece of functionality in the platform because it means that if a, a patient or a service user tries to access a waiting area, at, I don't know, let's say um, half past midnight um, uh, when it's uh, it's a, an eight or six service, um, then they won't be able to get into the waiting area and uh, wait there thinking that somebody's going to see them. They'll simply be told that it's closed. You can, of course, make this 24-7 if you chose to, um, and you can select different days of the week depending on uh, how often you want the um, waiting area to be available. Um, there's a test my equipment button. Um, you should definitely use that when you first uh, get set up with an account. Um, it's important to make sure your kit's working um, uh, before you do any um, uh, actual patient consults. Um, and I'd say actually what's even more important is to do uh, a practice um, patient consult with uh, another member of your team or, or department. Um, uh, that will allow you to really run through uh, and almost play out what a typical consult might look like and feel like and um, uh, make sure that you're well prepared before you go live with patients. Um, there's a URL here. This is the quick link to this um, waiting area. Um, so this, you could give this link to a patient if they needed to access this directly, um, uh, and we'll use that a bit later. There's a patient information leaflet, uh, and if I click on this button here, um, uh, this will download, and um, uh, you can see there I've got East of England ENT Review VC. It's an appointment letter. There's a bit of information here for patients. Um, what do they need to do to make a call? Is it secure? How much data will will I use? That sort of thing. Um, and if I jump onto the second page, um, it tells them uh, about the requirement to have Google Chrome uh, or Safari uh, on their device. As I said earlier, um, for a mobile phone, uh, a smartphone or a tablet, um, that's pretty standard. Um, for PCs and laptops, um, if you have a Windows one, you may not have one of these installed, um, but they're free to install and they're pretty straightforward. Uh, and we recommend Google Chrome uh, in particular if you're working on a PC. Um, so that patient leaflet's there. Um, and if your um, bookings team get this set up and you've got this capability, those kind of things can be emailed to patients um, when letters are sent out um, or text message alerts and that sort of thing. Um, and we've uh, we've provided some guidance on that to um, the teams uh, that are doing the implementation. Um, this one's a test site, so the support contact is myself, um, but this should be somebody within your trust uh, who you could contact if you have any issues with the, with the platform. So that's a quick walk around what the waiting area looks like. Um, I'm now going to show you uh, what it's like to get into a waiting area as a patient. Um, and I'll do this, first of all, by showing you a couple of uh, uh, real live uh, examples. So I've got here um, uh, the um, Airedale Trust website for Attend Anywhere. So it's just simply their trust um, website, airedale-trust.nhs.uk forward slash attend anywhere. Um, and this is essentially their virtual front door for their, um, uh, their video consult platform. Um, so you can see at the top of this, they've got a couple of how-to videos. Um, these are branded near me. Um, the reason they're branded near me is that they were produced by NHS Scotland, um, who've been using this platform since 2017. Um, and they published a review that had 98% positive feedback from patients. Um, uh, NHS Scotland decided to brand this platform uh, near me. So that's why it's called near me. That's their, their branding. Um, it's used quite a lot in, in the Highlands. You can imagine um, a, a real advantage uh, in terms of patient travel times up there uh, having this sort of functionality. Um, so the way that um, Airedale have set this up is what they've done is they've put individual links to different um, services on, on that web page. 
Um, so if, if you're in for ENT, you'd click on this link. Um, if you're in for a therapy services, you'd click on this link. Um, and they're all laid out there uh, as different clickable buttons on their virtual front door. I'm going to show you Imperial College. Um, this is a, this is a, a different approach. Um, so um, if I uh, just show you their short link, so their short link is imperial.nhs.uk forward slash video. Nice and easy for a patient to remember that or to um, type that into their phone. Um, uh, much easier than some of the short links that we'll show you later. So um, this was set up, as I said, um, a little while ago um, uh, at Imperial and um, they have uh, they have set this up in a pre-COVID context. Um, so this is for online outpatient video consults. This is their web page. There's a start video button here. I'll click that for you in a moment. It tells you a bit about accessing the clinic, about getting started, about the security of the platform. Um, and then there's some information here about their general booking office. Um, and again, they've got the same video, uh, the near me uh, video at the bottom of the page. Um, I'd, I'd recommend, and we've put the links to this um, uh, on the resources page and uh, the, in the slides for this training and also on our future site. I'd recommend having a watch of these. They're quite good uh, videos, very patient friendly um, uh, and uh, uh, quite simple to follow. So this button here, this is um, the way that you start uh, Imperial and this design of this start video call button is common to um, uh, a lot of uh, websites that are using attend anywhere. So I click on that as a patient. Um, and it says a video call to Imperial College, so I know I'm in the right place. Uh, there's a bit here about checking whether I'm ready to make a video call um, and a test button that will allow me to test my kit. Um, if this is set up right, as I said, and you've got text alerts or emails or, or letters going out, then um, uh, then it, it's good practice to advise the patients to um, uh, do a test in advance of their actual appointment uh, if, if it's an appointment service. Um, so then I click the start video call button and it goes through some routine uh, tests. So it's just check my connection speed. Uh, I'm working at home, by the way. So this is on a home Wi-Fi uh, at the moment. That I'm demonstrating this. Um, the speaker at this point, I have to switch off my video because otherwise it gets uh, confusing. Uh, demonstrating a video platform on a video platform uh, is, is a bit too much, uh, apparently, for my, my computer. So I will switch that off. Um, so there's a speaker test. Uh, microphone test and video test. I can see myself there. So then you get through to this page. Um, this is where it asks the patient to put in some personal details. Um, in this case, um, Imperial have only made the first name mandatory. See that star here. Um, uh, but there's also fields for last name, date of birth and phone. Um, you can make all of these mandatory if you choose, um, and that can be set on a differential basis by waiting area. Um, so you might, for example, say uh, for a sexual health service, actually, I only want first names. That would be in keeping with how a lot of those services are run. Um, but for other services, I'd like the date of birth and the last name and the phone number because that will make it much easier um, uh, for my clinical team to uh, click on the right patient when they want to start a consult. And it's good practice, of course, to start your consult by uh, re reconfirming the identification of the patient. Um, in in the, the trust that set this up during the national pilot, um, uh, a lot of them focused on follow-up appointments um, because that gave them a chance to have a conversation with the patient uh, and assess suitability um, in advance and, and, and agree that they were going to do this as the next, uh, next appointment. Um, in the context of COVID-19, um, we anticipate this will be used actually uh, for quite a lot of first appointments and drop-ins and things like that as well. Um, so you do need to think about your um, ID process. Um, in entering this information, um, the patient is making a, a, a conscious choice to provide this information um, and they have to tick this box here um, uh, consciously to accept the terms of use um, and the trust privacy policy uh, before clicking continue and going into the call. Um, again, that's Im important because uh, that could be taken as uh, implied consent, um, although the issue of consent is something you need to consider locally through your, your own trust governance. And we have put together a standard operating procedure for uh, for video consults, which has been signed off by the uh, Regional Quality Committee in the East of England, um, and that includes uh, the Regional Chief Nurse and the Regional Medical Director. Um, so that's a, that gives you a running start on, on your local uh, trust governance in, re in relation to uh, video consults. Anyway, so for Imperial, 
you have a drop down option here um, and you can choose which um, uh, which waiting area you want to go to. So there's cardiology, critical care, maternity, rheumatology, for example. I'm not going to go any further with this because I would actually go into one of um, Imperial's live waiting areas and I don't want to do that. Um, so instead, what I'm going to do now is jump back to our waiting area. This is our test one. Um, and I'm going to use our link here and show you what that looks like. If I put that in, um, start video call. Um, it skipped the testing because it just did that a moment ago. Uh, if, if I hadn't have just done uh, click through the Imperial one, it would have done the testing of my kit with me. Um, and uh, I can now put some information in here. Um, so uh, just have a go at doing that now. Um, and then uh, that's not my real date of birth, by the way. Um, uh, I then have to click this accept button, as, uh, as I said. Um, the difference with this one rather than Imperial is that we haven't set up the um, choose waiting area functionality. Um, instead, this is a quick link and it's taking me to this particular waiting area, the ENT one. Um, and this is why the naming of these areas should be as patient friendly as possible, because um, that probably wouldn't mean very much to a patient EOE, ENT, review VC. Um, if instead you put ear, nose and throat, they'd probably match that up against their their um, appointment letter. So if I click continue. So what you see next is this please read screen. Um, this is customizable at a trust level and at a waiting area level. Um, so the default text is what you see here, um, but you can change this if it's appropriate. Um, so at the moment, this says this is not an emergency service, um, that no one is permitted to record the call without consent, um, that everyone attending the consultation uh, will be introduced, that your video call will open in a new window, um, and that if you experience any issues, click the refresh button. Um, and that's really important, the refresh button. It does tend to fix most connection issues um, if you have those either at the patient end or the clinical end. Um, like I said, you can customize this. Um, uh, Dorset Healthcare, for example, uh, added a bullet point to say, um, uh, if you do not have an appointment, you will not be seen. Um, uh, that might be helpful if you're running an appointment service rather than a drop-in service. I press start call and as it promised, it opens in another window. Now, um, hopefully you can still hear me. I've sometimes had some uh, audio problems at this point in the demo. Um, so I can see myself. Um, I have a message pop up here that says, um, thank you for your call. Uh, someone will be with you shortly. Um, and it tells me that I'm first in the queue uh, for the East of England uh, ENT uh, waiting area. You can switch that on and off. So if it's an appointment based waiting area, then you'd probably want to switch that off. Um, in terms of the view the patient has, so at the top left here, there's that um, image of the temples. That would be your trust, uh, trust logo. Um, there's a chat button here. Uh, that's switched off at the moment because I'm in the waiting area rather than in a consult. But during a consult, I'd be able to use that. Um, as a patient, I can switch my microphone off and on, um, and I can switch my camera off uh, and on. Um, and I can share my screen, although that's not really very relevant for patients. Um, the other thing that will be here when you do this on a mobile phone um, or uh, a, a tablet with um, front and rear facing camera is there'll be another button that allows you to switch the camera from one to the other. And that's quite handy if uh, you're a patient and you want to be able to show your physician a, a rash or something like that. Um, or if you're a parent and you're um, uh, using this um, uh, for your child, and again, you want to show your clinician um, the child's leg or a wound or something like that. So settings button up here where you can change which uh, camera, speakers, microphone you're using. Um, that's particularly handy if you're using a headset like I am at the moment, um, or you've got multiple devices plugged into your uh, in, into your uh, PC or or other. The refresh button. I'll show you that later. That that tends to fix most things that break. Um, and then I can end the call here. So that's what it looks like as a patient. Um, when your call's ended, if you've set it up, there'll be a uh, patient survey link at the end of that um, and we're working with the implementation teams to make sure that's in place. That captures some uh, soft feedback from patients about how the um, experience was for them. Uh, really helpful in, in terms of continuously improving the way that the uh, online clinics run. So I've showed you now 
the um, the waiting area, what that looks like from a clinician perspective. I've showed you a couple of examples, um, Airedale and Imperial, of um, uh, what the patient front door might look like. Um, I've also shown you what it's like to click through and get into the waiting area as a patient. Um, what I'm going to do now is get into the interactive bit of the demonstration, um, and I'm going to ask uh, you all to um, use this hyperlink here. Um, you're going to need to type this into your mobile phone. Um, uh, I'm assuming pretty much everyone will have a smartphone that's either Android or iPhone. Um, so I'm going to ask you to type this in um, and go through the process I just showed you as a patient. And what should happen is that as you all start doing that, you should start appearing in my waiting area. And feel free to um, make up your date of birth and um, change your name if you'd like to do so. Um, but do please have a go at this right now. It's important because it will give you give you an insight into what this is like for a patient using this on, on their smartphone. Um, and what what the feedback has been so far uh, from, from Scotland and also from the national pilot in England is that most patients will use their smartphone for this. Um, that is is the most common common way that they'll do these consults with you. Um, so, um, uh, Sandra, can I ask you to do this as well to um, type this link into your into your yeah, smartphone? I'm going in now. Fantastic. Um, I'll also just paste that into the um, chat box in case um, in case anybody wants to um, uh, copy it from there. Um, so we'll we'll give you a couple of minutes. Um, part of the reason why it's good to have you um, test out writing this into your, your smartphone is, is you'll see quite quickly how fiddly it is to type in a URL like this into a smartphone. And and that really reinforces um, the message that having a single uh, entry point on your website is is really the best way to go with this. Um, it's, uh, it's much easier for patients, it's much easier for anyone really um, to go to um, uh, trust website slash video uh, than it is to type in um, uh, some hideous URL like this. So at the moment, I've got a couple of notifications popping up. Uh, they're popping up on my second screen because I've got two. I've got, I'm using a laptop with a second screen at the moment, um, uh, and um, I'm getting notifications pop up as as people appear into the waiting area. I'll give you a little while and wait till we've got a few more people coming through. Um, we definitely recommend. Um, using this platform with two screens if you possibly can. I mean, it works fine with one, um, but particularly if you're um, if you're providing a consult where you want to also access a patient administration system, then having the patient on one screen um, and your uh, your PaaS system on the other, um, that's a much easier way to work. Um, you can do it fine with one screen. That's not a problem if you've only got access to one, uh, but it's preferable to have two if you can. I'll just give that another moment. Um, I've put it in the chat box, so if you haven't caught it off of my share screen, then have a look in the chat box. So I'm going to scroll out now, and you can see I've I've now got a very busy waiting area. Um, so look, I've got all of these patients appearing. Um, uh, I can see, for example, Sandra at the top of the list. Um, that's because she was the first person to go into the waiting area. Um, it shows her name underneath that, her date of birth. Um, although I, I'm pretty sure she wasn't born on the 2nd of February this year, um, uh, and a telephone number. Um, other people, Jenny's only put her first name in because that was the only mandatory field. And so you can see here from, you know, from a clinic management perspective, um, uh, Sandra's information set is is preferable to Jenny's if you're trying to pick pick patients out of this um, waiting area against your clinic list or or whatever other thing that you're you're checking against. And and look, I've got loads of people in here now. Um, I can scroll right down. Um, and what I can do as uh, either as a clinician or actually as a service manager, um, we've got Bart Simpson at the, at the bottom there. So um, if I notify Bart, I can send a message and say, um, uh, how is Homer? Um, and that should pop up on Bart's, um, Bart's screen. Um, I, I can send a few other people a message, um, so uh, I can notify Paul, say hello, send a message. Um, Catherine, uh, we're running late. So this functionality to be able to send messages is quite handy 
um, uh, either if you're a clinician who wants to let somebody know that you're going to be running a bit late, um, or if you've got somebody working with you, a service manager, um, who's helping to, to manage the waiting area. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually demonstrate a live consult with Sandra. Um, so uh, for everybody else, um, uh, you can now uh, end your call um, and that will get rid of that hideous um, uh, hold music that you're probably putting up with uh, right now. So um, everybody else apart from Sandra, you can press end now um, and you'll leave the waiting area. So um, uh, yeah, and we can see, look, most people have, uh, have exited quite quickly. Um, those that haven't, you know, feel free to end now um, your, your call. So you've all gone in there as a patient. You've had, you've had that experience of getting on there with your smartphone um, uh, and, and the user interface and so on. Um, so now I'm going to start a call with Sandra. Um, I do that in the same way. I click on her name. Rather than clicking notify to send a message, I click join call. And this comes up in a new window. And here we are. Um, I can see Sandra on, on the left-hand side of my screen here. Um, she's using a smartphone. Um, and you can see the image quality is pretty good. Um, we're both working remotely on home Wi-Fi networks. Um, uh, and that seems to be working just fine. Um, this does work actually on um, on 4G or even 3G uh, networks if you're doing it, um, uh, if, if people are, are doing this without uh, without Wi-Fi, although it will use a bit of their data. So um, I think um, it's about uh, attend anywhere. Give Oh, my God, where's my login? Sorry about that. I don't know what I did there. Oh, here we go. Um, actually, this isn't a bad thing. You can see now what a waiting area looks like when there's people in there. So one person's being seen, um, one person's waiting. The longest wait is four minutes. Um, so it says Sandra's being seen at the moment. Um, uh, that's probably the other window that I, I, um, I've lost track of. Uh, so I'm going to leave that. Instead, I'm going to see K. Um, Sandra, could you um, could you exit your the the call, please? Great. Okay. Um, so let me just refresh this again. Okay. So there we are. Sorry about that. Um, if I click on K and click join call. Excellent. OK, so uh, my second attempt, a different member of our training team, um, uh, but we have started. So again, Kay's using a, 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 um, a smartphone from home uh, on a home Wi-Fi network. Um, this does work on a 4G or a 3G network um, and uh, uh, can, can be just fine on those, but it will use a bit of data doing that. Um, I think it's about 230 megabytes on a smartphone for a 20 minute call. Um, so it is better if people can use a Wi-Fi network if they've got access to that. Um, as a clinician, I've got a few more options than I showed you earlier as a patient. So uh, I've got a chat option here. Um, this is handy if you want to check that the um, uh, platform's working if you can't hear each other. So I can say, can you hear me, Kay? Uh, Potentially, otherwise, it's helpful if, if there are language um, difficulties and you want to write something on screen. Um, there's a microphone button to switch that on and off um, and a camera button. Um, you'll notice in the bottom right corner, yep, CK can hear me just fine, um, uh, that I can see uh, a small version of what K can see. So um, when I switch that on again, she can. this is the image of me that she can see. And when I switch it, uh, the camera off, it says video is currently paused and that appears on Kay's screen and she's nodding to um, agree with that. Um, there's a share screen button here. Um, this is really helpful from uh, a clinical perspective if you want to um, uh, share a diagnostic image or uh, test results or something like that. So if I click on this one, share screen, um, you have a couple of options here. Um, you can share your entire screen. That will allow the patient to see everything that you can see um, uh, on, on your screen. I've got two screens here, so uh, I could share my left-hand screen and it would show uh, the Teams window. Um, what's 
probably more more often useful is to be able to click on the application window and then I can select a specific window I want to share. So um, I'm going to show K what the waiting area looks like um, uh, and click on that. Um, it shows me what screen I'm sharing here on the right hand side um, and that will be uh, visible now on K screen and she can click on that if she wants to view it a bit bigger. Uh, I can click on it too and, and see what I'm showing uh, K if that's helpful and it just flips the uh, images around. So K's uh, images over there now and this one here. Um, if I click stop sharing, that will stop and we'll go back to our regular console. Um, I've also got a transfer button here at the bottom. If I click that, it allows me to transfer K into a different waiting area. So we had an ortho demo and a gyne demo waiting area. Um, so I could transfer K to either of those by clicking on one of those waiting areas. Um, that would be great if either she's come into the wrong waiting area by mistake um, or uh, there's some follow on piece of care in another waiting area that um, uh, we'd like um, uh, Kay to be able to uh, have access to uh, before she leaves the platform. Um, this next button here, invite, is really useful. Um, so this allows you to send an email or a text message um, to, for example, a friend or family member of Kay's that she wanted to uh, add into the uh, consult. Um, I've seen a question just pop up. Equally, this could be used to add a, a translator into the uh, video consult. That would be another way you can use this. Um, or another another member of staff as well, if you wanted to have uh, more than one team member in the consult. So those are the main bits of functionality at the bottom of your screen. Um, at the top, you've got that uh, image of the temples. That would be your trust logo. You've got your settings where you can, as I said earlier, change your um, microphone and uh, headset. Um, and then you've got this refresh button. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate this now. Um, for uh, let's assume that I'm having uh, connection issues at the clinical end, um, so I'll click refresh. Now, what should happen is that this should bring us back into the consult um, after it's refreshed. Let me ask you myself, and then Kay's rejoined the call, um, and that's really important because what it means is um, if if I'm having a connection issue at home or something like that. Um, Kay doesn't lose her place in the consult. She stays right there. And she doesn't have to start the whole process uh, from the beginning. And equally, if, if Kay was having a connection issue and press the refresh button, Kay, could you do that? Um, what will happen is uh, I've lost Kay for a moment, um, but she should reconnect and come straight back into the consult with me. That should happen in a moment. Excellent. So Kay's just rejoined the call um, uh, and you'll notice she didn't have to input her, her name or her date of birth or any of that. She didn't have to go into the waiting area and I didn't have to get her out of the waiting area into the consult. She just came straight back into the consult. So the refresh button uh, tends to fix most issues if you're having a problem with connectivity or what have you. Um, at the end of the consult, you would press this end button. Um, it will give you three options. Um, uh, you can return to the call if you didn't mean to end it. Um, you can leave the call just me. Um, what that will do is put Kay back into the waiting area. Um, uh, so that's great if you've got a multidisciplinary team or something like that, um, or you're, you're triaging. Um, so for example, I might be triaging and say, okay, actually Kay, um, I need you to be seen by another member of the, the team. I'm gonna put you back into the waiting area and I press this button and she'd go back in the waiting area um, and then somebody else in the team could uh, could then click on Kay's name and do a consult with her. Um, I can also end the call for everyone. Um, if I press that button, it will effectively uh, kick Kay off of the um, uh, off of the platform. Uh, she'll get a message saying her consult is finished. Um, if it's set up, she'll have an option to leave feedback via a link. So I'm I'm going to leave uh, the call just me. It tells me my call has ended. Um, uh, and if we've set it up, there'll be uh, a link there. Um, uh, and, and we've just seen we've got Donald Trump uh, in, in our waiting area. So that's that's novel. And he's a bit older than I thought he was. Um, anyway, uh, so um, uh, American politics aside, uh, if if you click that button, uh, leave just me, then Kay, Kay comes back into the waiting area. Um, and I can click on Kay's name here uh, and call activity. Um, you can see here it, it gives a brief summary of um, when we left and joined the calls. 
Um, and if we were working as a as an MDT, um, what you'd see is that um, another clinician could click on Kay's name, um, look at the call activity, and see that I've already I've already had a consult with Kay. Um, and and that's it really. I think I've yeah, I've given you a, a quick run round. Yeah. Can anybody hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Okay, that's fantastic. I'm just trying to work out whether this headset works. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Uh, I'll ask you to stick yourself on mute now. Thanks. Yeah, I will. Thanks. Um, okay, so so uh, that's a quick run round. Um, it, it's a pretty intuitive um, uh, user interface. Um, the main thing is you get your login going, and um, uh, you should be able to use all of this um, and, and run through a few task calls with um, hopefully some willing members of your team or something like that uh, before you go live with patients. Um, you need to make sure um, that your your um, your your trust governance has been complete. So um, we've we've got a full implementation pack. Um, this is a clinical training session, so we're not going to go through all of that. But um, there are a number of other steps that colleagues should be putting in place. Uh, and from your perspective, having a standard operating procedure that's been approved through the the relevant um, uh, trust governance is really uh, really important before you start seeing patients to make sure you're doing that in a a, a safe and appropriate manner. Um, a question has just popped in about how do you get your login? Um, you you get that login by um, your trust system administrator setting you up with a login. Um, that will be, um, uh, without knowing which trust everybody's from, I can't give you their individual names, but um, that will be uh, somebody that we've already set up with access to the platform um, who can then set you up uh, within your organization. Um, so they'll be doing that as part of their implementation plan. It's probably the person who, um, who gave you access to this training link in the first place. And just okay, to add, can I just add to that, Zef, um, just to say that um, as soon as your um, login has been set up, you'll actually have an email into your email box um, and it'll have a URL and you can just copy and paste that into your browser and it'll come up with a login page. Thanks, Kay. That, that's really helpful. Um, uh, Miriam, I, I can't, I'm afraid, recap the first 10 minutes, but um, uh, we are making some recordings of this available on the Futures page and we will be running um, uh, almost identical training sessions tomorrow at um, uh, 11.30 and 3.30. So if you want to jump onto the first 10 minutes of one of those, um, then you can see that first bit then. Um, otherwise, we'll run out of time now. Okay, thank you very much, Seth. Um, I'm just going to grab the screen back. And I'm just going to take you back to the agenda just to make sure everybody's happy with the topics that we've covered so uh zef did a demonstration there on the product platform he shows you the patient experience so he dialed in himself and then he showed you the clinical experience and then we had our interactive practice session so we all dialed in as a patient and he was able to demonstrate the clinician view uh, during the video consultation uh, if you've got any questions about any of that at all, just put them through on the chat session. And when I've just wrapped up the next few slides, we'll do a Q&A at the end. OK, so um, this is just really for information, this slide. It's a, a word cloud and it comes from a survey of about 200 services. And it just shows you really the specialties that they chose for video conferencing. So in particular, the big ones where it says gastro, rheumatology, cardiology, etc. Those are the specialties that were more popular for video conferencing. So it's just a question of your trust thinking very carefully about which services they want to put on and perhaps avoiding the ones where you know, initially certainly where you need blood tests. Uh, diagnostic tests, those sort of um, tests before, you know, during the consultation. So a few more things to think about here. How many waiting rooms your trust may need and the naming conventions. That's also important. Um, again, the specialties here, which specialties make best use of seeing patients in a virtual environment. And there is also um, Something to think about here is the receptionist role managing all your waiting rooms for you. 
Um, we know that's been done, particularly in the trust in Scotland, and it is very successful. So it's just something else to think about at this stage. Now, before I go into uh, the troubleshooting slide, I just want to take you to the NHS Futures website. So once you've got your login and you've come in and you've got your video consultations area, we've got all these sections down here. Uh, you've got your training resources in this bottom section here. They're not the training videos aren't all in there yet, but we're hoping to get there in the, get there in the next couple of days. Um, we have got the launch video, so that's in there. We're going to get the presentation that I've just gone through. We're going to get that on there as well in the next couple of days. And I'll go back into the main section at the top, the green section. OK, so we've got four folders here. Um, we've brought in some of the Attend Anywhere documents, so they are on their website, but we've, we've brought in the ones that we think would be particularly useful to you. And then we've got the supporting documents from NHS England. So there is a, actually a clinician survey that you can use after each um, consultation that the clinician can fill in a survey. You can also have patient surveys in there. These are actually being forwarded to the project managers. So just something for you to be aware of. And there is um, the FAQ, which I need to just quickly point out to you, which is being updated on a continual basis. So any questions that get asked in these sessions, we've got the question and answers in the document in this folder. So we can see at the bottom, we've got the FAQs here. So pretty much everything, certainly from our side, is in there. Um, and then if I just go through troubleshooting, signposting and support, so first of all, your trust IT will be the first line of technical support. And then we're proposing a clini clinical and patient help desk, which is under development at the moment. So we'll let you know more about that. Um, I've just taken you into the Futures website, and that includes the FAQs as they become available. And we've got the patient and clinician survey links in there as well. And don't forget that your implementation partners are to be the point of escalation and support for your trust. So speak to your project manager if you're not sure um, if you want to escalate anything via that means. So I can't see the uh, Q&A, but I don't know, Zeph or Kay, if there's anything that you can pick up and yep. uh, just bring out. Yeah, we've had a few questions. I've I've tried to answer uh, several of them in the chat box, but I'll summarise for anyone who um, who hasn't been able to see the chat box. Um, so th there are a few questions about um, uh, can can you do group consults uh, using this, and can you add more than one clinician to a consult? Um, yeah, both of those things are possible. Um, I know Dorset Healthcare have have done some group sessions um, on this before. Um, I think there are. Uh, after a certain number of participants, the performance will will not be as good. So I think um, when you start getting above kind of five, six people in a consult, it doesn't work quite as well. Um, uh, but there is experience from uh, from other organisations that have done that. Um, there there were other questions in here as well um, about um, uh, can you add another doctor to a to a consult? Um, yeah, you can. That invite button um, I referred to. That is a good way of doing that as well. Um, uh, Kay, are there other questions you think we should um, just recap on? Um, there's a question from Paul. How will our patients be informed of the platform? So obviously that's down to your business processes um, and internal trust policies in terms of how you actually um, communicate with your patients. So I'd say, go, you know, have that discussion with the implementation team. That, that's right. And um, 
there, there can be both um, proactive and targeted communication on this. So um, you might do something proactive and put something on your trust website. Um, uh, you might do something targeted in the sense that if you get your uh, booking system updated, then um, your appointment letters or text messages or emails or however your trust does that um, could uh, be set up with a new template to tell the um, uh, to tell the patient that um, uh, they're going to be seen by a video. Uh, and I think in the current context with COVID-19, um, uh, that, that's not something that will be um, unexpected for a lot of our, our, our patients and service users. And there's a question there about, can this be used in A&E? Um, I know that some there was some thinking going on about using this in urgent care. Um, in terms of the rollout in, in the east of England, we're working with the ambulance provider as well. Um, uh, we've, we've got access for all um, NHS trusts and foundation trusts in the east. Um, so we're going to be having conversations, but I'm afraid I can't be more specific than that at the moment. Um, I think there's a question from Warwick. Um, um, if I read this out, I'm not quite clear as to what the ask is. If we constructed a written formulation or diagram, can you send that to the service user via the system? Well, um, kind of yes and no. So the, this platform doesn't allow you to send materials to the patient. Um, it allows you to interact with them. So I tend to describe it to people as saying, rather than sitting across your consulting room, um, uh, you're sitting across uh, uh, your laptop. Um, and so every every other part of your normal process should run pretty much the same. So if you record the outcome of a consultation in a patient administration system, then you should do that afterwards using the patient administration system as you do now. Um, uh, and all of those other processes should run the same. So this won't allow you to send something direct to a patient. However, and this is where the yes bit of the answer comes in. Um, if you had a diagram up on screen, you could share your screen with the patient during the consult and say, look, here's a diagram I've drawn. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, this, this is something you might want to think about or, or whatever. Um, but to actually email it to them um, or send it to them via another means, um, the platform doesn't do that. And I suppose what you could do is if you're actually sharing the screen and they can see it on their phone, they can actually do a snap picture of it so they can actually keep it in their pictures as well so they will keep a record of that as well so that facility is there. Um, an additional question we got from Lisa, um, any translation function? Um, there, There is the ability with this to invite a participant, a, a third person into the consult and that third person could be a translator um, uh, but it doesn't have a built-in translation function. So it's got the capability to add a translator um, if you've got somebody providing that service. Um, and we've got a question from Christopher. Is there any way of turning off the waiting room music or announcements? Um, um, it, it Apparently, so <laughs> I had a conversation <laughs> with, with the managing director for Attend Anywhere about this about a year ago because particularly when you get you listen to it a bit, it's quite frustrating. Um, so I think it is possible. Um, we need to put that on our FAQs, Kay, because I think uh, you can't replace it with nothing um, and, and then therefore it's a judgment. I mean, as a clinician, you won't be listening to that whole music um, at all. Um, it's the patients that do, um, and there's a judgment about whether it's more reassuring to hear hold music or more annoying to hear hold music. Um, Patricia had a question saying, how does this work for people with who are hard of hearing? Um, so there isn't so anything built into the platform that I'm aware of um, about that. However, if people are using their own device, then they may have their own accessibility settings set up for it. So if somebody's using uh, an iPhone at home or an iPad or a computer, they may have switched on accessibility settings themselves uh, that would um, allow them to change the, the volume or, or connect it to a hearing loop. I think that's all the questions I can see on the chat function. Great. OK, well, if anybody's got any other questions, you're very welcome to email us um, on the email address we gave you earlier. Uh, you're welcome to hop onto any other sessions that we've got running either tomorrow or we'll publish the ones for next week. Um, but yeah, just keep in touch and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.